It is our pleasure to co-host this important conference with the South African Research Chair in Social Policy led by Professor Jimmy Adesina and the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Kadesria, represented by its Executive Secretary, Dr. Godwin Morunga. And you will hear from both of them uh, later uh, this morning. Today, it is my great honor to chair the Tandika Makenda Weiri Memorial Lecture, which will be delivered by Professor Fantoshero, whom I will present to you in more detail before his speech. In our opening panel, we will hear from Professor Adesina introducing the Memorial Lecture Series, followed by Dr. Godwin Morunga and by statements from members of the Makandawiri family, Ms. Karina Clint and Andre Makandawiri. Dear Karina, Andre and Joshua, thank you so much for joining us today. It is very precious for us to have the opportunity to share this moment with you. Finally, allow me to say a couple of words on how Tindika who was director of UNRWAST from 98 to 2009, shaped and inspired our work until today. Yesterday, we had already very fruitful discussions around Tendika's work on the democratic developmental state and the transformative social policy approach, which posits that economic and social policy have to work in tandem and are mutually supportive. Professor Yayati Ghosh, our first keynote speaker, emphasized how much social policy is a crucial instrument to get out of multiple crises, of which the current COVID-19 pandemic is a recent culmination and amplifier. She emphasized that global South governments need to increase their bargaining power and resist austerity pressures while also driving structural transformations of the economy and building social protection floors and public services. All this is extremely relevant for UNRWA's research and its focus on alternative economic approaches and the achievement of social justice, as well as gender and climate justice. Just before handing over to the distinguished panelists today, I want to highlight three particular aspects of Tandika's work that are currently informing our research at UNRISC. One is related to our initiative to discuss the possibilities of a new ecological social contract to overcome multiple crises and create a better post-pandemic context. Tandika has developed many ideas that are highly relevant for this debate, not the least his emphasis on state accountability and democratic checks and balances governing state-citizen relations. But in particular, the importance of social contracts for grappling with the social question, while also addressing the developmental question. In his keynote address at the Social Policy in Africa 2017 conference, he explained that the coincidence of patient capital long-term productive reinvestment of profits, and patient labor, as Andrew Fisher has explained yesterday, a type of wage compression that ideally goes along with rising productivity and therefore allows for wage increases, is a good starting point for productive labor-intensive development. I think we could label this constellation a developmental social bargain, although the current context of neoliberal hyperglobalization is not conducive to such a bargain, but that's a broad discussion. A second issue concerns the importance of history and colonial heritage. There is increasing awareness in the global South that historical injustices are rampant from slavery to genocide to robbery of cultural and artistic artifacts to diverse forms of oppression and exploitation of people and natural resources all of which require redress, compensation, and efforts to restore justice. These issues need to be discussed when we talk about a new eco-social contract at the global level, aiming to tackle some of these injustices in international relations. The other issue is colonial heritage, which Tandika has analyzed in different publications and in one of his last works for UNRIST regarding the impact of colonial legacies on welfare regimes and tax regimes. I very much like his conclusion he put forward in a book chapter in 2020. Colonial legacies are not destiny. Indeed, the process of challenging such legacies can be stimulus to efforts to redress the injustices of the past or to create new institutional arrangements appropriate to current conditions." End of quote. In his view, we need to look at history to realize what the structural constraints are but this does not mean that we cannot overcome these constraints. And finally, looking at the four roles of social policy, production, reproduction, redistribution, and protection, 
We have seen various shifts over the last decades as different development models put different emphasis on each of these roles. In my view, the four roles constitute a compass of sorts telling us when social policies are either sidelined or when they are not sustained by the economy, when some sort of imbalance arises. In the context of the social turn that we have witnessed over the last decades, an increasing focus on social policy and development policy and practice, which was mainly a focus actually on social protection, the focus has shifted towards the role of protection. And against the backdrop of rising inequalities, the focus has shifted towards the redistributive role. And while there is nothing wrong per se with these shifts, we should avoid trading off one role against the other. Maybe this is the time to refocus attention on the role of social policy for production and reproduction, especially as many of the drivers of our development, care and climate crisis are rooted in these two spheres. With these remarks, it is now my big pleasure to give the floor to Professor Jimmy Adesina for his statement about the memorial lecture. Thank you, Jimmy, uh, and please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Kaja. Um, All right. Uh, Marius. Uh, today we launch a program of annual memorial lectures in honor of Tandika Mkandawiri. Tandika's, you know, the, the series was to many, Tandika was to many of us a friend and a mentor, a remarkable intellectual inspiration and someone who taught us what it means to be human. A joint initiative of CODESPA and the Sachi Chair in Social Policy, we're delighted to have Henri's partner with us in the program. Tandika passed away on 27th March, 2020. At his passing, he was Professor and Chair of African Development at the London School of Economics. Before moving to LSE, Tandika was Director of the UN Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva. Before then, he was the executive secretary of Cordesvia. Although trained as an economist, Tandika was intensely interdisciplinary, bringing a distinct sociological sensibility to development economics in the tradition of Gunamedda. Tandika was part of the core of African post-colonial intellectuals with a fierce commitment to the imperative of the continent's charting its development path and intellectual autonomy. He was born on 10th October, 1940, in the Gwanda district in today's Zimbabwe, to an Indebele woman and a Malawi man. He will relocate with the family to the Copper Belt in today's Zambia, where he had his primary education and later moved to Malawi for his secondary education. Barely out of school, Tandika would become actively involved in the anti-colonial struggle for an independent Malawi. For this, he would be jailed twice by the British colonial authorities. He won his scholarship to study journalism with economics, with economics as a minor at the Ohio State University in the United States, but will change his study to a major in economics. While in Ecuador with his supervisor, he found himself stateless. The government of Kamuzu Banda had canceled his passport for his outspoken comments against Banda's emerging dictatorship. The US will not allow him back. But Tandika received a reprieve from Sweden. He will move to the University of Stockholm for his further studies. Originally, Tadika moved to Dakar for a research project at the UN Institute for Economic Development and Planning, then under the directorship of Samir Amin. Subsequently, he joined the recently established Kodespia. He will be seconded to the Zimbabwe Institute of Development Studies 
before returning to Dakar as the acting executive secretary of Kodesia and later his executive secretary. While Samir Amin and Abdullah Bujra had nurtured Kodesia to its form in its formative years, under Tandika, Kodesia became the continental leading social science council that we know today. In the words of Achima Fiji, under the leadership of Tandika, the council asked big questions and engaged in big issues about the continent's future and provided the platform and the leadership for African voices on Africa's future. From a critical engagement with the impact of structural adjustments on African society, economy, and polity, to the democratization agenda for the continent, the council dealt with the urgent and enduring issues of the time. In addition to supporting the older and younger generations of African scholars through the dark days of severe funding cutbacks, the championing and the defense of academic freedom led by the council owed mainly to the vision and the values that Tandika brought, brought to the work of the council. It was not simply enough to provide resources for sustaining African scholars. It was essential to ensure that they had the space to engage in critical research and analysis. This will culminate in the International Conference on Academic Freedom organized by the Council in Kampala and the adoption on the 29th November 1990 of the Kampala Declaration on Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility at the end of the conference. The conference and the declaration responded to the widespread curtailment of academic freedom that intellectuals faced across the continent. For a new generation of African scholars coming to their own, Kodesia provided a home, a space for intergenerational dialogue and interaction, and a pan-African space to see beyond one's national predicament and boundaries. I'm of course giving a bi bi biographical account here. The research and dialogues would be nothing if they could not find outlets. In the publication programs, the drive was to provide space for African voices to gain visibility. Two crucial values that Tandika brought to his work at the council, a high level of probity and asceticism and a vigorous defense of African researchers' right to define the agenda and pursue their works without outside interference. He left the council in 1998 intellectually robust and financially stable. The next phase in the leadership of the institute, insti institutions by Tandika was at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva. He was appointed as director of ONRIS in 1998, a position he held until 2009. As with his earlier stints, at Zitz and Kodesvia. Tandika brought to bear on the work of the Institute visionary intellectual leadership, immense capacity for fundraising, and the mobilization of a global network of researchers to address research and policy issues. The social policy in the development context that he initiated was one of them. Between 2004 and 2014, the program generated over 16 books and numerous other publications. I spoke at this, about this at the opening ceremony and elaborated on the seminal intellectual contribution that framed the theme of this conference. Tandika's intellectual contribution are as diverse as they are rich. This range from the debate on democracy in Africa, in which he insisted on valuing democracy for its intrinsic value to the idea of developmental states in Africa and the imperative of democratic developmental states and projects. Given our diversity, Tandika has argued that we are condemned to democracy, in quote, one that promotes a democratic culture in society and governance rather than the former procedures, procedure driven democracy. In these areas, Tandika will produce iconic phrases such as trustless democracy, disempowered democracy, maladjustment, maladjusted African economies. He fleshed out the imperative of democratic developmental states in the economic transformation of Africa. 
Underpinning the idea of a democratic developmental state is a more robust take on social policy. The notion that development involves traveling the veil of sweat, blood, sweat, and tears is something that Tandika, like Amatya Sen, rejects in, in, in terms of choice and human capability. On the twinning, the, on, underpinning the twinning of development and equity are the expansive social policy instruments that undergird under the development strategy. A central contribution to this is the idea of transformative social policy. Tandika insisted that the literature on development, democracy, and social policy should talk to one another and contribute to a theoretically rigorous idea of an inclusive democratic developmental project. The intellectual contributions of Tandika and its examples of commitment, ethical lifestyle, and fidelity to conviviality continues to inspire many of us. The annual memorial lecture program is not only dedicated to sustaining his memory, but propagating and elaborating on his intellectual contributions. Again, I thank Professor Fantu Cheru for accepting our invitation to deliver the inaugural lecture. We could not have had a more worthy candidate to deliver the inaugural lecture. Finally, I thank Karina Clint, Andre Mkandawere and Joshua Mkandawere for their generosity and for giving the approval to, for the program of the memorial lectures. Today, we affirm this. Tandika may be gone, but will not be forgotten. He lives always in our hearts, in our minds, and in our works. Asante sana. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for taking us through a couple of the milestones of Tandika's work and life and for remembering him as a person and as in his role as mentor and inspiring us intellectually and also as someone who has, has really founded and, and uh, put life into institutions that have been the home for, for many students, many scholars, and have really helped to propagate uh, these very important approaches that have been so important for, for the development debates in Africa and beyond globally. I would like to give the word now to Godwin Moronga for his introductory statements to the Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, th thank you uh, very much, uh, Kajahoyo, for the uh, invitation and uh, to Professor Jimmy Adeshina uh, for uh, the initiative uh, that uh, comes to fruition uh, today. Um, uh, I think that both uh, Kaja and uh, Jimmy have uh, laid out and summarized perhaps adequately uh, the journey uh, that uh, we all have had uh, with, uh, uh, with our um, mentor, Tandika uh, Bukandawe. Uh, one of the uh, privileges I enjoy as uh, the seventh executive secretary of Podestria, but also the hurdle I have to jump uh, has always been to speak about uh, occasionally uh, senior colleagues who had uh, such enormous impact uh, on uh, my career, uh, on my education, uh, but who uh, I never really had a long standing relationship with. Uh, I, I, I was first with this task uh, when uh, Professor Samir Amin left us. Um, I, I was first with a similar task when uh, I was asked to speak at the, uh, at the celebration of the, I believe, 70th birthday of uh, Pasoya uh, in Ghana. Uh, uh, and uh, often I find myself in a situation where uh, I am lost for word. Uh, partly because uh, these are inspirational figures uh, whose uh, engagement with me uh, has always been, uh, in a sense, one that is mediated by a whole range of things that I never personally experienced. But uh, as I was preparing this morning, uh, I, I do remember uh, one of the last meetings uh, I, I had uh, with Dika. Uh, this one was, um, you know, at... Uh, the sad moment when we arrived in uh, for the uh, burial of Professor um, Sam Moyo. 
Uh, and uh, I recall it was my sitting at the for some of our things to be cleared. And uh, Tandika made this joke with the, which has remained me for a while. He said to Embrima uh, that Embrima, during your time, you have kids who know what he was saying. Uh, so I was reflecting about the fact that uh, uh, he passed on uh, in in, um, in 2020, and the uh, secretary uh, constantly speaks to me in many ways that uh, that I can't recount. Uh, but the very last uh, session I had with was actually in central Stockholm. Uh, I, we were fan uh, ICDA to review proposals from uh, a number of uh, African universities. Had roughly three hours of dinner uh, with, with Tandika. Um, and even at that time, moment in time, uh, you had that uh, Kodesria mattered so much to him uh, that he felt, you know, he needed to hand to hold your hands, encourage you, do all those things. It's precisely because of these uh, memories that I carry, uh, and uh, with the gratitude that I need to convey to both Karina uh, and family, I, I can see uh, Andre and um, and Joshua are online. Uh, that we, I feel very strongly that Kodesria owes to Tandika and his family a lot more than uh, we have received, and the consequence of this, therefore, is uh, our very interesting, uh, our, our very immediate support uh, for the memorial lecture, uh, which uh, Jimmy has elaborately spoke about and for which I don't want to uh, to repeat. Um, and I hope that the memorial lecture begins to carry the spirit of uh, Tandika's work, the spirit of his uh, very rich uh, humanity uh, to the rest of us. Uh, it is our hope uh, that uh, every volume one I mean, every number one issue of Kodesria Bulletin will carry uh, uh, a keynote address given through this lecture uh, as one of the lead articles. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Fantu Sheru uh, is the appropriate person to be the inaugural uh, lecturer for this, uh, uh, because Fantu, Fantu knows very well uh, Kodesria, interacted with Kodesria, participated in our activities, um, but also was involved in evaluating some of the the council uh, run under Tandika and after. Um, but also Tafantu has a, a rich understanding of the Nordic world uh, and, and uh, through his experiences there, especially at the Nordic Africa Institute, uh, we couldn't have gotten uh, the best person other than uh, Fantu to do this. Um, it is indeed, uh, therefore, a pleasure for us to dedicate ourselves to, 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 to this particular dimension of Tandika's rich heritage, but also to mention that uh, one of the things that we have tried to do since 2020 uh, has really been to create a space at Kodesria, a digital platform where as many of uh, Tandika's works can be accessed, uh, including a, 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 an annotated bibliography, a digital library of many of his speeches. Uh, and uh, uh, during this discussion, I hope that uh, my colleague uh, Basiru uh, will be able to post this for colleagues uh, who are uh, attending this conference to be able to, 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 to review uh, and carry as much as you can. We are going to carry the flame of Tandika's work uh, uh, to as far as we can, because he left us no alternative. Uh, he wanted us uh, to be able to continue in the path of his work. And we really feel totally privileged to be allowed to, to do this. So thank you again, uh, Jimmy Adeshina. Thank you again, the team that is running this at UNISA, uh, and also colleagues from the UNRIST uh, for joining us uh, for this particular activity. And uh, I really want to thank again, uh, Professor Fantusher for agreeing to proceed with this memorial lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Godwin, also for sharing some, some of the, the moments you have shared with Tandika and uh, how inspiring it was always, you know, each and every conversation that we had with him kind of opened up 
new perspectives and new research projects. And I think we have so much lined up over the years that there is a, such a rich set of questions, as I said, you know, that in each and every conversation came up. So this will facilitate, um, you know, our work in, in the future and, and keep really his, his, uh, his entry points, his conceptual frameworks alive. And thank you also for, for informing us about, about uh, um, the activities, initiatives taken by Codesria to, to really put, you know, to, uh, at the disposal of everyone, you know, a library and the works of Tandika. I think this is a very, very, um, uh, uh, will be a very rich repository and very important um, for all of those who have, you know, studied and followed him and really want to delve deeper into his works. So now it is my great pleasure to, to move on to, to the statements of the Makanda Weira family. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to give the word to Tadinka's partner, Karina Klimt, for her statement for the memorial lecture. Please, Karina, you have the word. I can't see myself, but... I can't see my myself. You um, just yeah, use, so use use the what do you call it the camera the start video button. Click on it. It says that the host has stopped it. I think it's for the host to open. It doesn't, it just says it cannot start your video because the host now start now. No, it doesn't. Now we can see you, Karina. Okay, now very good. Works. Okay, very good. Madam Chair, Unisa, Cordesria Nundrist, dear organizers, dear participants, thank you for inviting us to this event. Special thanks to Professor Jimmy Adesina for having kept in touch and ensured the participation of Tandika's family. It's quite emotional to see so many colleagues and friends of Tandika's gathered, many of whom I've had the pleasure to meet over the years. I will just say a few words on a more personal note. I experienced Tandika's devotion and commitment to his work through our more than 30 years of companionship. Work took us from Dakar to Copenhagen, Geneva, London, Cape Town and Stockholm. No matter where we were, Tandika always worked with Africa in his heart and his mind. At home, there were books, books and books everywhere and in Tandika's office, of course. The rucksack that he carried every day was loaded with books so that at any given moment he would be able to sit down and read on the tube, in the cafe or a pub. He would always have a pen and notebook in his pocket. Then there were all the papers and chapters at various stages of finalization. I witnessed the importance of Tandika's work, his mission, an all-encompassing sense of duty to the public good. Those of you who have worked with Tandika probably remember the days of multitasking. Tandika would love to share the tricks of a new software, introduce a new database for facilitating library cataloging, and explain the advantage of a digitalized accounting system. I want to share a memory from our early days, a weekend in Paris. Tandika wanted to find a software to take back to Cordesria in Dakar. His idea was to have the bulletin typeset and published in a proper academic style. Having worked as a journalist in his young days, he had a good grasp of layout and typesetting. He was not happy with the tools available in the simple word processing program of those days. He had found that the desktop publishing program called Ventura had recently been released. This was in the late 80s. 
it would allow one to create a more professional style with proper fonts. We looked all over town, but the program had not yet arrived in the computer shops. We were, however, told that it might be available in an industrial area near the airport. After rushing from warehouse to warehouse, we finally found it. Tandika was exhilarated. This absorbed most of our time, not quite what I had in mind for a Paris getaway. But then hanging around with Tandika was always fun and exciting. He was a great improviser and would always somehow manage to find time for moments of leisure. Meeting friends, listening to jazz, watching comedy, and of course, most importantly, spending time with family. Only in Africa, especially in Malawi, did I see Tandika really relaxed and in proper holiday mood. The opportunity to exchange ideas with colleagues and friends at conferences was crucial to his work, just as meeting the young, the new generation of researchers and academics. In his last years at LSE, Tandika had the opportunity to go back to teaching. He felt invigorated and inspired by the discussions with his students and often came home excitedly talking about the wild and clever ideas that had come up during seminars and talks. He loved mentoring. Tandika never stopped learning, be it in the academic field, a new language, or playing the guitar. And he never stopped sharing his wisdom. Over the years, I saw Tandika's importance to our others as a father, go-go, family member, friend, teacher, and colleague, even as opponent, always, always leaving a mark. He charmed everyone with his smile, generosity, wit, and naughtiness. I miss his warmth, kindness, and humor, his optimism and positivity, his explanations and decoding of events, big and small his views sometimes unexpected, but always interesting, eye-opening and thought-provoking. Tandika wanted to make people think for themselves, rather than telling a person off in disagreement, he would elegantly tease and challenge them to rethink their conclusions, compelling them to rely on facts rather than sentiments and prejudice. Read, read, and read was his mantra. It's with great pleasure and comfort that I see how Tandika's hard work and ideas have left a lasting impression and that they are being elaborated on for future projects by his colleagues, as well as by a new generation of young scholars. He couldn't have wished for a better legacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina, for sharing this with us. I think there's nobody who can give us a better picture of Tandika as in his entire personality and as a human being, as a scholar, as a family member, as a friend, uh, as you can. And this was really a very important moment, I think, in this conference. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, I think you have also given us a lot of kind of, you know, these more, you know, these lessons for students, for colleagues, you know, never stop le learning, never stop sharing the wisdom. I think, you know, this is really something that each and every scholar, professor, researcher, you know, should take to his and her heart, um, because this is what our profession is about. And this is how, you know, we can make progress and bring more people uh, into the networks of, of, of the work we are doing. So thank you so much, Karina. And I would like to give um, the floor now to, to uh, Tandika's son, uh, Andre Mekandwiri, or I don't know whether it's um, uh, Joshua. It's yes, I, I could start. Um, yes, please, Joshua. And for the sake of nostalgia, I'm actually at the Stockholm University in the very library where I know our father spent many hours. Um, 
So I would like to begin by thanking everyone on board here today on this conference, everyone from Codestria and Unrest, and of course, Jimmy Adesina uh, for reaching out <clears throat> to us and yeah, for making this possible in honor of our father, Mr. Tandika Mkandawira. Uh, I would indeed like to share a few words about our father also on a more personal note to me or rather to us, uh, he was simply our father, but also a man who constantly assured that he did his best to lead us the right way. Tandika Mikanawiri was except from being an amazing scholar, researcher, a professor, a critical thinker, a man who really understood his culture and had a delicate and exquisite taste for art and music. Hence that inspired me to commence my many years of my own musical journey. And besides being our old man with his many years of hard work and dedication, his commitment for an academic freedom, equality for those in poverty and in colonial rule, his relentless motivation and his generosity in airing out and sharing his many ideas. He was also a great father to me, Andre, and to some extent to our youngest brother, Jeffrey Ilunga. And he always made sure that we had the facilities we needed. Those of you who knew our father well will also know his philosophy around the concept of both working hard and playing hard. A balance in life that became, that he became a master of conducting. Uh, our father used to repeatedly remind me of two very important things. Um, and I quote, life is all about choice and there are no shortcuts in life. These are two of many of his quotes that I use as a compass to my own everyday life, thanks to him. And uh, I would just like to end by saying forever in our hearts and in our minds, our father, Mr. Tandika Mkandawir, and uh, thank you very much for letting us be a part of this. Um, I will now pass the word over to my elder brother, Andre Mkandawir, and, and let him continue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joshua. I think we are, is Andre here? I think I saw, I saw him on the screen a couple of minutes ago. Maybe he, he lost the connection, I don't know. Mm. Perhaps. No, 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 no. He 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 joined. I've just promoted him to panelist now. So. Okay, I see. I see him appearing on the screen. So there we go. Please, so, Andre. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, sorry for the technical. Uh, so, so thank you. Thank thank you very much, uh, dear friends. Um, um, uh, so in a way. I think our father's home, or, or at least the place which he called home, was denied from him you know, during his more than uh, 30 years in exile. And he used to say, home is where your heart is at. And I think he used that as an antidote to not being able to visit the place where he perhaps uh, staked his earliest territorial claims. But he also had his heart placed elsewhere in the academics. And this was the space which he dedicated his life and work in the pursuit of an autonomous space for African uh, intellectual development. And it gives us the family great pride and joy to see how you, his academic family, have rallied not only to honor his memory and academic achievements, but to carry his torch forward. And uh, I would just like to convey our gratitude and support to the South African Research Chair in Social Policy that in partnership with Codestria and UNRIST have organized um, the 2021 Social Policy in Africa Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre and Joshua also for sharing some of Tandika's wisdom with us, I really like to be reminded of the fun part uh, of your father also. And as you said, uh, work hard, play hard. We had many very, very nice gatherings and probably many of us 
remember, you know, his wit and his humor and, and um, you know, how to, to share positive emotions and really make everyone feel part of a group. And, and also thank you, Andre, for considering us Dendika's academic family. I think this is uh, something also we are really happy to be a member of. So I think this was a, was a very, very important and very personal and emotional part of this conference. And we are very grateful that you support the, the, the lecture series that you join us for this conference and that you shared um, you know, these very personal memories and insights of your father and your partner with us. Thank you very much, McKenna Weary family. Thank you. And, thank you. And it's, it's now my great pleasure to, to move on to the Memorial Lecture series and to introduce Professor Tom Tuchero, Emeritus Professor of International Political Economy at American University to you, delivering the inaugural Tindika McKendawiri Memorial Lecture on the topic of on resuscitating the aborted national project, a retrospective and prospective view. Godwin has already mentioned a couple of the milestones in Professor Shero's um, long and distinguished career. And I would like just to resume this very quickly for you again. Currently senior researcher at the African Study Center at Leiden University, he previously served as associate senior fellow at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the North-South Institute in Ottawa, Canada, and as a research director at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden. Dr. Shero also served as a member of the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's panel on mobilizing international support for the new Partnership for African Development, as well as a convener of the global economic agenda track of the Helsinki process on globalization and democracy. He also served as the UN Special Rapporteur on Foreign Debt and Structural Adjustment, and he was an advisor and consultant to several governments and donor institutions including the UN Economic Commission for Africa, UNDP, UN Habitat, CEDA, Danida, NORAD, and others. He has published an impressive number of important books and journal articles and I would like to encourage you to read. It's a great honor to have Professor Shero speaking to us today. Please enjoy the lecture and also take note of your questions or post them already in the Q&A box as we will have a few minutes for discussion after the presentation. Please. Um, Professor Shero, it is our great pleasure to give you the word for the inaugural Tandika Mekandawiri Memorial Lecture. All right, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Professor Fanti Shero. I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. I would normally have addressed you from Addis Ababa but i have to evacuate myself a few days ago because of the deteriorating political situation in the in the country uh let me first of all uh, thank my longtime friend professor jimmy adesina for inviting me to give this inaugural address it is a tall order to try to give a talk on the intellectual contributions of tandika makandewere to the social sciences he covered so many timely and important topics in the field of development. His work was cumulative and exhaustive for me to be able to summarize and discuss them in the time allotted to me today. I also want to thank uh, Jimmy Adesina for carrying the transformative social policy torch, a topic so close to the heart of our late colleague Tandika Makandewere. This is a topic that Tandika theorized deeply and subsequently built one of the most successful research programs during his tenure as director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva. Tandika dedicated his time in grounding theoretically the transformative role of social policy. This particular theoretical journey into the social policy came after his groundbreaking work on the harmful effect of structural adjustment programs, while others such as Sir Richard Jolly and Giovanni Adria in Rome uh, at UNICEF had started to take a critical look 
at Structural Adjustment Program and came up with the idea of adjustment with the human face, Tandika took theorizing on the transformative role of social policy to the next level once he arrived at UNRIST in 2009. It is really difficult to think of a scholar who is driven, as Tandika was, on the imperatives of promoting development in Africa. Because of his lived experience and encounter with colonial rule, he was a free nationalist, a pan-Africanist, an anti-imperialist. Because of his demeanor, the way of speaking, one would not suspect that he carries all these admirable uh, levels. It was not only the radicals who always sought his wisdom and critical perspective on any topic, but also the conservatives, conservative academics and politicians who disagreed with him on so many issues but still seek his acquaintance. The more he provokes them, the more he demolishes their distorted worldview, the more they actually want to engage him in a debate. He was an amazing storyteller, he was a voracious reader and interested about everything under the sun. More importantly, he had a fine sense of humor, loved to have a good time uh, with friends. My talk today is primarily concerned around the many memorable conversations I had with uh, Tandika over the last four years. We lived in the same town but very rarely we saw each other because when when I'm out of the country he is in Sweden, when he's out of the country I am in Sweden, so rarely but this moment where we meet which was just uh, precious. I think the last of those lunch meeting I had with him was on December 6, 2018. Little did I know that over the subsequent months his health was to deteriorate. The talk of my the title of my talk today is called, entitled Resuscitating the Aborted National Project, a Retrospective and Prospective View, a topic that Tandika had written and spoken about. I chose to use the term aborted instead of unfinished national project deliberately. My aim is to show the interconnectedness between the notion of democracy, development, independence, the centrality of the state in transformative politics under an overarching theme of what I call the nationalist project. These themes are rooted in Makandawere's deep thinking on the national project and its future. I purposely use the term aborted to imply that our present politics is disembedded from our rich history, that is a history of resistance, a history of pan-Africanism, and a history of anti-imperialism. I sometimes feel that the current generation are completely disconnected from this rich legacy of, of the founding fathers. We live in very interesting times and I wish Tandika was alive to deconstruct many of the contradictory tendencies in global politics. We are experiencing tectonic, tectonic shift on many fronts, political, economic, social, ecological. These contradictory shifts have a strong bearing on the trajectory of African development and more particularly on transformative and emancipatory national project. So as a scholar and practitioner <laughs> and a critique, I'm trying hard to unlearn what I have learned, which is difficult to do. Given the complexity in global politics, we need to break away from our own disciplinary ghettos and try to look at things very differently. Tandika thought coherently. He rejected disciplinary boundaries. It is increasingly obvious for us now that we need really new politics, we need new analytical narratives in order to achieve structural change, in order to achieve a whole new emancipatory nationalist project. For us Africans, to embark on the task of writing a new history, we must go back and re-examine the past. We need to pose a retrospective and prospective view. For me personally, it means revisiting the visions and aspirations of the aborted nationalist project, forced self-determination and independence, underpinned by a broad 
this quest for African Renaissance and unity of the African people. To quote Adebayo Adedeji, the former head of ECA, I quote, he said, a society which forgets the instructive value of its past for it is present and future cannot be self-confident and self-reliant and will therefore lack internally generated dynamism and stability. There's the need to have this retrospective and prospective views in terms of the future. Is there anything we can learn from our history? Can we go back to the nationalist project? What is the objective of the nationalist project? In this context, let me sh start by recounting the objectives, achievements, shortcomings of the first nationalist project of the late 1950s and 1960s, whose aim was to overcome the institutional legacies of colonialism. And inspired by the political thinking of early nationalist leaders, such as Kwame Nkrumah, Modibo Keita, Seki Toure, and many others, African countries embarked upon programs of nation building, national development designed to bring the fruits of social and economic growth to all sectors of the population. So for the early nationalist leaders, self-determination was a precondition for realizing all human rights, particularly the right to development. So the nationalist project was therefore a strategy for more equitable appropriation of the productive forces at the local, continental, and global levels. It involves basically a deliberate state intervention to strengthen national political capacity in the face of the polarizing logic of world order, which undermines such capacity. So further inspired by the spirit of the 1955 Bandung Conference on Non-Aligned Nations, the nationalist leaders also joined by other newly independent countries from Asia and Latin America called for a new international economic order under the auspices of the United Nations. Though little progress has been made since 1975, African countries remain fully engaged in the struggle for reforming the global governance architecture. So in the early 1960s, 1970s, as a result of these state, deliberate state actions, African economies registered impressive growth rates given the initial conditions at the time of independence. Physical infrastructure were greatly improved, particularly in the areas of health, education, communication, new universities, agricultural research centers, national transport network, and local government structure was established to facilitate the national development project. Since the early 1980s, however, this mood is dispelled by increased level of poverty, social disintegration, and political instability. So the spectacular political economic progress registered during the first decade and half of independence is now a distant memory. Instead, the balance turned again once again shifted in favor of nations and social classes which are based place to profit from the polarizing logic of the world order. In short, the politics of inclusion that was central to the nationalist project had been overtaken by the politics of exclusion. Let me stop right here at this point and a word of caution is in order. Let me not over glorify the nationalist project. There were problems at, 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 at many levels. Uh, among the many contradictions that Tandika pointed out, I will focus just on, on three of them. First was this whole emphasis, the need to maintain national sovereignty and nation building, were high in the agenda even if that means dismissing the existence of deep divisions and cleavages based on ethnicity, gender, and class, and religion. So ethnicity and tribalism were officially banished, while in practice they were the main criteria for distributing public resources in exchange for social groups' recognition of the authorities in power. Tandika referred to this practice, quote, nationalist by day, 
tribalist by night. The nationalist discourse basically, as I say, denied these ethnic claims. It denied subnationalism. It denied the existence of tribes. That's the first contradiction. The second contradiction has to do with that class analysis were never fully embraced by a nationalist movement. Instead, the focus was became on ending past forms of racial and horizontal inequalities without transforming the old order. There's policies such as indigenization, Africanization, black economic empowerment, as in the case of South Africa, were uploaded very much praised in the face of growing intra-group inequality. That was again the second contradiction. The third contra contradiction also was the central assumptions of the African Nationalist Project of the 1950s and 1960s were the centered around the idea of what I call industrialization by invitation, that it is possible and that it is ach its achievement is dependent upon the maintenance of intimate link with the former colonial powers. That, of course, led to the division, if you recall, to the so-called Casablanca group and the Monrovia group during the formations of the uh, Organization of African Unity. So there were certain contradictions with the nationalist movement. However, in total, I think they did achieve quite a significant amount uh, in the economic and social areas, despite all these contradictions uh, during that period. But what really contributed then to the premature demise of the nationalist project? Certainly there has been contradiction both in the independence struggle itself, in the post-independence experience with development and nation building, the post-1980s experience with market-oriented reform dominated by the policy of structural adjustment, and later in the post-1990 experience with liberal democracy. In each phase there has always been contradiction. So I think are already halfway into the first decade of independence. Many commentators were sounding alarm bells that the politics of inclusion is being overtaken by the politics of exclusion. Publications like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, Basil Davidson's Which Way Africa, René Dumont's 1965 book False Start in Africa, Ojinga Odinga's 1967 book Not Yet Uhuru, and many others elaborated on how things were moving in the wrong direction. What, how else can you really explain the fact that one African dictator after another extend their hold on power through the ballot box with increasing regularity today? However, the conventional wisdom about Africa is that the continent is marginalized because it is not sufficiently integrated into the capitalist, capitalist global economy or pat, you know, patrimonialism is rife and goes against entrepreneurship and capitalist accumulation. Both assumptions have been refuted by Makandawere in many of his writings. To the contrary, I take the position that a proper understanding of Africa's marginal position must be put in a broader context, particularly in the context of North-South relation. In addition to the crisis of leadership, which I have just elaborated at the national level, there were bad rules, unjust trade agreement, illegitimate debt, and bad, bad policies imposed by on Africa by the institutions of the world system have produced multiple black holes of social exclusion, pockets of slums, and disabled nation-state. If there is anything pervasive about the presence of the past, it is this lack of freedom to maneuver, the ever-shrinking policy space we have to recognize. Claude Ackay agreed with me on this. In his last writing before his tr tragic death, he argued, I quote, It's not that development has failed in Africa. It has never begun. Because of exogeneity, Africa never had a development agenda, but a confusion of agenda. In a sense, he then called upon all of us to challenge and subvert the constraint of dominant and receive disciplinary approaches and paradigm, a sentiment also shared by Makanduere. So as Africa entered the decade of the 1970s, the nationalist project was being threatened from within 
and from without. Whether with political independence was achieved through direct negotiation or through the barrel of the gun, the nationalist leaders came into the world stage in a very unfavorable political and economic environment and with little room to maneuver. Consequently, pragmatic accommodation to the inherited international system that became a preferred solution than revolution or delinking. Only a handful of other countries set out to transform their economies from external domination by promoting self-reliance strategy but with limited success, as in the case of Tanzania and a couple of other countries. The nationalist project was also undercut by poor political governance as an unaccountable political elite often supported by competing Western powers, let loose their predatory instinct and indulge in corruption, abuse of office and repression. As the African military emerged as the sole conductor of state politics in many parts of Africa from the 1970s onward, the nationalist project took a different direction. So the whole thing, the emphasis became power over welfare personal over institutional consideration, national unity over distributional justice, security over development. So in a sense, centralization, expansion of state bureaucracies and encourage a top-down approach to management of public affairs. Most importantly, as I said, the post-independence international context was not conducive than the colonial one. Uh, as particularly in the context of East-West rivalry, conflict between within African states were intensified as a result, as each side backed their own dictators who abused their power to enrich themselves. So as the African nationalist project came to be perceived by external actors as being synonymous with uh, communism, leaders who expressed any desire to chart an independent development path were either assassinated or overthrown by western sponsored military coup. Lumumba, Nkrumah, Sekitore, you know the story. In their place, neo-colonial regimes, both civilian and military types, were imposed and were often sustained by foreign aid. Thus, barely halfway into the second decade of independence, the vision of an independent Africa had started to fall apart and the gulf between the state and society widened considerably in the process. But as Africa entered the decade of the 1980s, 1990s, a new world order has emerged that favored powerful Western nations and giant firms that are best placed to profit from the polarizing logic of world order. This is what Susan Strange once referred to as the rise of business civilization. Imperialism basically has changed its color and modus operandi. So debt structures, conditional aid flows, and equal systems of trade became the main instrument for regulating Africa's development. The operative logic of the post-1980 political order has been that market economies give birth to democratic rule. And the latter, in turn, contribute to well-functioning market and, pro and prosperity for all. Following those logic, as I said, we've seen through the 90s, conditional lending became the main instrument to get African countries to open up their market, dismantle many aspects of the African state, and institute minimal democratic procedures essential for the well-functioning of the market. In the process, what is left of the development welfareism of the 1960s and 1970s were completely erased from the economic reform agenda. So policy making, an important aspect of sovereignty, has been basically taken away from the hands of African countries. Seven decades later, here we are. The role of the state in Africa as a driver of development has been significantly curtailed. The dominant of market forces is set in place and economies have been wide open to external competition. Yet. Few African countries have achieved credibly in terms of any of the indicators that measure real sustainable development and instead most have slid backward into growing inequality, ecological degradation, deindustrialization and poverty.
by imposing particular policy choices on poor countries, creditors basically take away government sovereignty and accountability to their own people and instead make them answerable to unaccountable external institution for their choice of economic policies, their level of spending on public services, and as a critical political decision. This is recolonization, not development. So, how do we resuscitate the nationalist project? How do we move forward? I think Africa's marginal position in the new global hierarchy provides us with a compelling occasion to seek a transformative and emancipatory national development project that will create the necessary policy space. A transformative and emancipatory project will entail the need to adopt key reform at the national, regional levels with greater emphasis on what I call strategic integration of the national economy into the international economy. There are several questions I want to raise at this point. First, what is the future of the national project? How and who should resuscitate and drive the new national project that is emancipatory? Second, what is the lineup of the balance of social forces that are capable of contributing to the construction of a new emancipatory national project? Is it civil society? It is the peasantry? Is it intellectual? Who? We need to figure that out. Third, is an African-owned, African-led development agenda possible in an environment of high level of aid dependency, endless conditionality, shrinking policy space that characterize donor-recipient relationship? What are the objective conditions that today that will permit a transformative national project to emerge? I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of these questions today, but I'll try. So what are the preconditions for a transformative emancipatory national project? While the aborted national project of the 1960s operated within the confines of the inherited colonial order, the new transformative project is essentially a strategy for more equitable appropriation of the productive forces at a lo local, continental, and global level, level. It involved, as I said, a deliberate intervention to strengthen national political capacity in the face of this polarizing logic of the world order, which undermines that capacity. So where do we begin? First, of course, renewing and restoring democracy in Africa, a number one project. Not, not standing remarkable progress we've seen earlier on, democracy in Africa is still in profound travel and has not moved beyond the holding of elections. Entrenched repressive structures continue to frustrate that process. This is partly because democratic institutions, including from legislature, local government, electoral bodies, political parties, the judiciary, the media and civil society remain weak and are therefore unable to act as countervailing force to an often powerful executive branch of government. Makandawere referred to this phenomena as choiceless democracy. So for democracy to succeed in African context, there must be significant social reform, a reduction of inequalities, as well as the decentralization of political power and decision making. So by enlarging visions, raising consciousness, citizens can undermine the vicious circle of mass exclusion and marginalization. This will in turn, of course, increase the legitimacy of the state, as the people will possess major decisions and feel involved in decision making. So the most reliable way of getting the citizens behind a nationalist project, development agenda, is through democratic structures and the empowerment of people at the grassroots level. So this is one of the starting points, one important pillar to, to get into an emancipatory national project. Second will be, will be uh, building a democratic developmental state. So central to Africa's renewal is the development of a strong, democratic, activist state that would assert its development role within the context of a common national vision. So successful development demands a greater role of the state 
in the economy than neoclassical theory has assumed. A competent state has a vital role to play in guiding national development, ensure egalitarian distribution of resources, linking urban-rural production, and investing in human capital formation to provide equal opportunity and upward mobility for all. This has been the experience of the so-called successful East Asian countries such as China, India, Vietnam, you name it. In other words, if the market is to function effectively, it requires an elaborate state guidance. The third is important pillar for me would be constructing a viable social contract underpinned by a strong social protection system. So in order for democracy to succeed, there must be a significant social reform. So in every political system, there must be a bargain in being a member of that political community. A social bargain is the glue that keeps the political community together. It is within this social bargain that every citizen seeks to exert accountability. So there got to be some form of a social contract underpinned by a strong social protection system. Fourthly, is here again revitalizing agricultural, agricultural production and empowering the peasantry. I think the disappointing economic performance of the continent over the past four decades has been caused to a large extent by the failure of African government to create a proper condition for an agricultural revolution to take place, which would in turn propel the process of industrialization. Of course, the priority task of an agri African agricultural revolution that will remain for several decades to come is obviously very complex and multifaceted. At the minimum, it requires the presence of a strong and effective enabling state with the capacity to respond to the demands of rural producers. The fifth pillar would be investing on African education and basic research. Africa cannot flourish unless there is intellectual capital of the continent to develop and maintain. An intellectual marginalization will occur unless the continent raises its educational levels and standards. I think the only way to narrow the knowledge gap is by investing in education, basic research and development. Investing in education and basic research should emphasize the need to scale up the technological ladder and tap into the global system of information and knowledge. So major work has to be done in educational reform throughout the continent. And finally, the critical element of the strategic alliance between business and government. Because transformational change that will move African countries forward to a different level and quality of life requires the simultaneous engagement of the three major elements of society, the private sector, a strong effective developmental state, and of course, certainly the civil society. One key factor that contributed to the spectacular economic transformation of the East Asian countries has been the strong business government strategic alliance under the guidance of an activist developmental state. Policies are implemented through the private initiatives rather than public ownership, through the market mechanism rather than administrative control. In this regard, economic policies are formulated by a capable, pragmatic economic bureaucracy, which through formal informal ties with the private sector develops a common vision of development objectives and target and common understanding on how this can be achieved. Finally, is the need for Africa to secure policy space by pursuing heterodox economic policies. I think developing countries need policy space to exercise institutional innovations that depart from the now discredited conventional Washington consensus. So the key to Africa in today's world is to try to weave through the parameters set by the world economy and maintain as much independence or policy space as possible. I think the lessons from China and East Asia certainly demonstrate the importance of pursuing heterodox national policies that support strategic industries, develop internal infrastructure, 
invest in human capital formation to provide equal opportunity and upward mobility for all and control financial markets. So they were able to succeed for two reasons, that A, the government had the freedom to control basic economic policy, B, the state had the administrative, legal, regulatory capacity to guide the market in a way favorable to the national development. Therefore, an effective state is a prerequisite for a well-functioning market. What nation, what nation states do in regard to domestic wage levels, foreign investment, public services, economic diversification can help determine to a considerable extent whether a country develops or not. Although these powers are not always simple or easy to exercise, they have by no means completely disappeared from the national arena. Let me conclude. The current development crisis provides us with new opening for activism, for social pact, public policy debate on a number of key issues aimed at reintegrating the economy and the society through democratic politics. Structural change requires the reconfiguration of the balance of social forces. In other words, social movement, labor movement, student movement, peasant movement, consumer movement, in order to create genuinely redistributive structure and institutions at the local and global level. In short, I'm calling for new politics of liberation. We need a major paradigm shift, a new analytical narrative on what is to be done. Of course, the resistance will take many forms and the outcome will depend on the capacity of the forces of civil society to gain sufficient influence to qualify as genuine counter-project. Therefore, a strategy of recovery should center on transforming the production system, transforming social relations, and transforming democratic governance at the global and local levels. Central to this endeavor is the need to employ social policy as an instrument of recovery. The social question cannot be disembedded from the economy. The economy cannot be separated from the social question. To repeat, we need new politics, new analytical narratives, and what is to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fantuchero, for this inspiring lecture. And um, you have given us the roadmap, basically, also how to move forward. And uh, also going back to history and taking the lessons from the past on the nationalist project in Africa has been, has been extremely informative and, and uh, interesting for us. So thank you so much. I could make more comments about your lecture and, and uh, trying to synthesize what you said, but it was so rich and I think that everyone has taken so many insights and food for, for thought from it that I would really like to open um, the space for a couple of questions and a, a short discussion on this because I'm sure, you know, that the many, many issues and, and, and topics and also, you know, the many recommendations of how we can create this transformative emancipatory nationalist project while also embedding it, you know, in a strategic integration of African countries and the region, the continent into a reformed global economy. And all of this, you know, built on a new type of politics and a new analytical narrative for which, you know, the, the community we are part of, the researchers, the think tanks and the institutions are working very hard. Uh, so we have a lot of um, um, issues to talk about. And I see, I can't see any questions now in the Q&A box and I have asked uh, people to post them there, but I would like to open the floor for anyone who would like to ask a question. We still have 10 minutes uh, if Professor Shero is able to take questions. I see Dennis Canterbury. Yes, please take the floor, Dennis.
Dennis, your mic is up. Dennis, your mute. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you very much, Katya, and thank you very much, Professor Chiru, for this inspiring lecture. I'm from the Caribbean, as you know, and um, in the Caribbean, everything you said seemed to be so relevant to um, what we're doing there and what's lacking and what could be done across there. So your work is not only significant for the, for the continent, but also for um, us in the Caribbean. Um, I'm happy that I stayed up at this time of the night here, it's three o'clock in the morning here to listen to your lecture because it's um, it's really inspiring. But I have a comment that I want to make, sort of a comment question. And this is um, this notion of strategic integration into the global um, economy, integrating Africa into the global economy. This idea also came up in the Caribbean about integrating the Caribbean into the global economy. And I'm saying, my, my concern is that uh, it seems as though we were already at the very center of um, international capitalism because uh, in its very formation and in terms of its very, um, its continuation, uh, Africa as well as the Caribbean are very central to this process. So I'm wondering how are we going to be integrated into something that we were already in? And if you can possibly elaborate on this question of um, integration into the international global economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. If Professor Shero allows, I would also like to put forward three questions that come up in the chat and then ask you uh, to, 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 to give your answer to, to the four questions, if that is possible. So we also have a question from Ebena Oduro, who's, who is asking, what role is there for regional integration? What form should it take? And we have a question uh, by ATSC Marcia, who is asking, uh, how can we construct regional social policies in Africa? So there is uh, uh, a slight uh, connection between the, the two questions uh, going uh, towards the regional level. Um, and then there is a third question by Mogisha um, asking, what would you comment about the tendency by African governments to vulgarize higher education by promoting bootlicking leadership in a bid to control one of the most vociferous voices of civil society? And how can academics operating in such a context contribute to the vision you have outlined? So we have one question about the strategic integration of, of, uh, of developing countries, African, Caribbean, others into, into the capitalist a global economy of which they're already part. And then two questions around um, the, the regional, uh, regional integration, regional social policy, and one question uh, about higher education in Africa. So, so please, Professor Shero, if you would like to, to take these questions. Uh, I will uh, try to address them as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody else. Uh, uh, for, for Dennis, who is up there in the Caribbean, <laughs> very early, uh, very important question. Uh, I think my old colleague, my late colleague, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein was saying, you know, uh, the capitalist system is the only game in town. In a sense, you're right, we are integrated. The question is how do we strategically uh, deal our relationship, manage that relationship in such a way uh, that the relationship you know, become very uh, strategic uh, because we are already integrated. It is the only game in town. Within that context, how do you provide, give yourself a space, uh, pursue policies that, that would be in the, in, in the national interest? Uh, so it, here it requires, I think, strategic integration also uh, is not only what 
nations do at the country level. I think the second question on regional integration is very relevant here. I look at regional integration as a counter hegemonic strategy. It's one part of you know, the tools you use to expand space in terms of, of an aspect of regional integration. So in a sense, I think uh, the, the choices we have through collective action, as well as through uh, the kind of strategies you will take at the national level, uh, have to be strategic, have to be informed, but the, we have to be very clear in terms of what the end goal is without compromising uh, uh, the, the national uh, political decision uh, processes. These are difficult. I'm not saying this is easy to do. Uh, I can tell you just my own engagement over the last, uh, in, in a limited space, uh, context in the context of you know, the experiment of the developmental state approach strategy in Ethiopia under Meles Zanawi. I mean, it was not a perfect policy. There was some attempt then to reclaim the policy space, but of course, in not, not that everything was successful, but there was a demonstration what can be achieved. But you add that measure at a national level, complemented with also a regional approach, where you use regional integration, cooperation as a counter hegemonic strategy you reduce the degree of vulnerabilities individual countries or you know, con you know, a number of countries can come together to act. So that's the reality that we deal given the fact it is a totalizing that the capitalist system is basically the only game in town within that, how can you operate? How can you maximize? How can you avoid things that can be avoided to the risk, but also take advantage of what you can get out of it. So these are, it's kind of a very pragmatic way, given the realities we have experimented with alternative approaches that are not uh, produced. On the third question on higher education, that is the, the biggest issue for me, uh, connected at many levels. Uh, uh, to what extent, I mean, we have literally, particularly in the continent, the state of higher education in general is pathetic. Now, the universities is where uh, uh, government have basically used it as the instrument of social control rather than as an instrument of liberation. Uh, that's one area we also have to begin to see where the whole system of education system from uh, primary to particularly at the level of higher education is where it's contested where it is uh, dealt with in such a way uh, that it undermines development, it undermines democratic aspirations, it undermines so many things in many ways that, that have not been a critical areas where, where uh, it has to be uh, given significant, I'm not even talking about quantity and quality issues. It is, it is the whole political economy of higher education have to be looked very seriously uh, in, in many, many ways. Without that, it simply, it is one of the mortars that plays across sectors, across issues on, on our politics, on, in our economy, in our social relations. That is one space that we have to also have to reclaim as quickly as possible as part of this larger emancipatory uh, project. I'm not sure I've been able to answer all of them, but generally these are bigger issues. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, res you know, relate with people. I'm sure you should be able to, to write me. I'll be very glad to communicate individually and you should be able to get my contact details from the organizers that I'll be uh, very happy to, engage, to continue to engage in this, in this endeavor. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Fantashero, also for offering to continue the debate. I think you have given us so many entry points and it aligns so well with what is going on in our institutions also within UNRIST and I guess in Pudesria and, and, and the social policy chair. So thank you so much. We couldn't have you know, a better 
uh, first inaugural uh, uh, memorial lecture um, to, to, to debate and to remember and to take forward the rich legacy of, of our professor and director and friend and mentor, Tendika Mekanda Wiri. So thank you so much for this. And with, uh, with this, uh, and again, a huge thank you to all the panelists, uh, Jimmy and Godwin for introducing um, the motivation for this lecture series for all the members of the, the Mekanda Wiri family for sharing their, their thoughts uh, and very personal moments uh, with Tandika uh, to all the participants who have listened and, and asked questions. And uh, I think I give a hand over to Jimmy um, um, okay. for, for guiding us through, through um, the, the program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kaja, you know, and uh, Professor Fantucheru, um, as always, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we will... Uh, have the comfort break now and uh, return at uh, 10.45 uh, Central African time and the third breakaway sessions. So again, uh, people should uh, click on the links, uh, you know, for the specific uh, session they want to attend um, in the program. Thank you very much. <laughs>